If you're like me, you like a little cup of joe in the morning. Some coffee, a couple of lumps of sugar, some milk, and maybe, if you're feeling wild, a bit of rum in it. Many of these products, rum, sugar, coffee, they're made in the Caribbean today, the region that we're studying in this section of the World History course. Well, none of these products were originally from the Caribbean. Just to make this little cup of coffee, Europeans had to completely refashion the environment of the Caribbean and kill the indigenous population of the Caribbean in the process. What happened to the Taino population after the first voyages of Columbus? How did the plantation economy emerge? We're going to discover that today as we explore the history of the Caribbean in the 16th century and one of the most important developments in world history, the Colombian exchange. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome back to the Modern World History Course. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. In our previous lecture, we studied Christopher Columbus uh, and his first voyage to the Caribbean in 1492. Today, we're talking about the Spanish colonization of the Caribbean. Uh, so let's move on to his second voyage in 1493, which is less known, but equally important. Columbus, he came back with 17 ships, not three, and over a thousand people, because now the goal was not just exploration, but conquest and colonization. And he also brought a bunch of crops from Europe that he wanted to introduce into the Americas, like citrus and wheat, as well as pigs and cows, but more on that later. His main focus initially was the island of Hispaniola, which today would be Haiti and the Dominican Republic. His first Spanish settlement in Fort Navidad in Haiti, that was destroyed, and the second one in Isabella, that was quickly abandoned, but the third attempt in Santo Domingo that was a charm. Santo Domingo is still the capital of the Dominican Republic today and the oldest European town in the New World. Beautiful town, by the way, if you want to visit. But Columbus, he did not come to an empty island of Hispaniola. Uh, the northern part of the Caribbean, uh, it was inhabited by indigenous people known as the Tainos, or the Arawaks. They came originally from South America, just like another group from the Caribbean that's known as the Caribs, or the Kalinagos and they lived in the smaller islands of the, the Lesser Antilles at the bottom of the map. So these two indigenous groups, they were on the receiving end of the conquest. Do you remember the three genes from the last lecture, God, Gold, Glory? Well, Columbus had come in large part to make money, the second gene, uh, either through farming, all those new crops that he had introduced, or through mining, because there was a bit of gold in the region. But he did not come to work himself. You know, he and many Spanish settlers, they aspired to become Hidalgos, Spanish nobles, who commanded others, but did not perform manual labor. Remember that Spain was still a feudal society, where peasants, serfs, uh, they worked for their lord, and so Columbus tried to simply replicate that feudal system in the Americas. The Spanish, with all, they were also familiar with a second model, uh, because before getting to the Caribbean, Europeans had already settled Atlantic islands like Sao Tome, Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands for Spain. And there, in those islands, they had introduced tropical crops, like sugarcane. They had forced the native population to work on plantations. They had wiped them out in the process, and then imported slave labor from Africa to replace the natives that they had killed. And to a large extent, this is what happened in the Caribbean as well. So, drawing from these two models, feudalism and the Canary Islands, the Spanish introduced a new labor system called repartimiento, or encomienda, which is very similar. What was that, you might ask? Well, the Spanish conquistadors, they divided the land amongst themselves, including the people who lived there, the Tainos, and they created little kingdoms, uh, just like in medieval Europe, where a lord, a Spanish conquistador, uh, would rule over his serfs, the Taino Indians. Uh, the lord had the authority to force Indians to work for him for part of the year, uh, for free. Not really slavery, which was a different legal category, but definitely forced labor. Uh, but then the Lord, he also had duties. He had to care for his wards and protect them and convert them to Christianity. So a paternalistic system. The Spanish conquistador would be like a, a father to the Tainos. So how did that system work out in practice, not on paper? Was it as benevolent as it pretended to be? Well, to answer that question, one big issue when we study the period is the lack of sources from the Amerindian side. As you know, history is written by the winners. 
So one Taino leader in Hispaniola uh, was Anacahuana, who was a brother of one cacique, a chief, and then the wife of another. And I have a video about her on the Women's History playlist if you're interested in learning more about her tragic life. Anacahuana was a, a queen, but also a playwright who organized plays that were called aretos. And there she and other Tainos would commemorate their past by reenacting it in a play. Uh, the Tainos were illiterate, they could not read and write, uh, so that was a way of preserving their history. But that oral culture, the Aritos, that disappeared with the conquest, so we have no account of Taino history written by this Taino queen, Anacoana, or any other Taino for that matter. So instead, we must rely on accounts by the Spanish, the very people who were trying to take her kingdom and force her people into servitude. Far from ideal. According to Spanish authors, the only sources that we have, Anacahuana was, quote, very dishonest in the venereal act with the Christians, unquote, and, quote again, the most dissolute woman that can be found on the entire island of Hispaniola, unquote. So basically, they called her a whore which is rich coming from Spanish conquistadors who spent uh, so much time sleeping around in the Caribbean that they brought back syphilis to Europe. No comment. And then when they were done bad-mousing her, uh, the conquistadors uh, hanged Akanoana and that silenced her for good. Our best source on the Spanish conquest uh, is a man called Bartolome de las Casas. Uh, he came from Spain. Uh, his father had actually traveled with Columbus on the first voyage. And the son, Bartolome, he came on a later voyage and settled as an encomendero, a man who used Taino laborers under the repartimiento system. But Las Casas quickly realized that the repartimiento system, as it was practiced in the Caribbean, had nothing to do with the letter of the law as designed by the king in Spain. In practice, the Tainos would spend so much time working on plantations and mines that they had no time to tend to the fields, and famine was an issue. And if they ever dared to complain or rebel, the, re uh, the revolts were then put down cruelly by the Spaniards. One good example was Atue, who was one of the, the caciques, or the, the chiefs. Uh, he re rebelled against the Spanish because, well, the Spanish had mistreated Taino laborers so much. And the Spanish eventually captured Atue and sentenced him to die in a horrible way. He would be burnt at the stake. Stake, S-T-A-K-E, not S-T-E-A-K. He was tied to a, to a pole, not a piece of meat. I've had students make that uh, misspelling. Anyway, at the last minute, the Spanish proposed an enticing deal to Atue. If he renounced his Taino gods and embraced the Catholic religion on his deathbed, so to speak, then he would be spared. Well, not spared in the sense that his life would be spared, but he would be garroted, strangled, which is a less painful way to go. Atue was interested and he asked for details about the Catholic faith, so there was some weird session of impromptu catechism while Atue was still tied to his stake. And when he learned about heaven and hell, he asked the priest, what about the Spanish people? Do they go to heaven as well? And the priest was adamant, yes, we're good Catholics, we go to heaven. And then Atue said, please burn me. Now, rather than spending eternity in heaven with conquistadors, he preferred to burn at the stake. Hell, fire, and brimstones. That's what he wanted. Las Casas was really moved by this incident, which made him understand the intensity of the Taino dislike for the Spaniards, who were supposed to be their fathers, their gentle overlords. And Las Casas also realized that Spanish brutality was counterproductive when it came to converting the Tainos to the Christian faith, which supposedly was the main justification for the Spanish conquest, the first of the three Gs. And he was very religious. So the death of Atue, that was a life-changing moment for Las Casas. He abandoned his encomienda, his plantation, he was ordained as a priest, and he dedicated the rest of his life to converting the Taino population to Christianity and denouncing Spanish exactions against them, even though he was Spanish himself. And that earned him the nickname Protector of the Indians. His main achievement was a book entitled A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, uh, which basically was the first history of the Caribbean. He's a colleague of mine. And that book was a major hit in Europe, even though it doesn't exactly make for light reading. Uh, you can see from some of the engravings I'm showing you that the book depicts some horrible scenes. A baby's skull crushed, a woman raped, caciques burned to death, the wholesale destruction of the Caribbean, as the title indicates. 
Las Casas dedicated his book to the King of Spain, Philip II, to inform him of all the atrocities committed in his name and convince him to reform the repartimiento system. In a sense, the book was a success. Shortly after it appeared in 1542, the King of Spain issued new laws, the Nuevas Leyes in Spanish, and these condemned atrocities against Indians and phased out the repartimiento system. So, great success, right? One man, Las Casas, stood up for what was right and reshaped the whole history of the region on his own. Well, not quite. The Nuevas Leyes were often ignored in the New World, so forced labor continued long, long after 1542. And Las Casas was also seen as a failure in his time because by the time the new laws were issued in 1542, the Taino population of the Caribbean had largely ceased to exist. According to Las Casas, as of 1492, when Columbus first got to Hispaniola, there were something like 3 to 4 million Tainos on the island. But when the census was taken there around 1542, 50 years later, there were only 600 left. And if you travel to the Caribbean today, most peoples you encounter will be descendants of the European conquerors or of the African and Asian laborers uh, who were brought in at a much later date. So you have a small Carib community in the island of Dominica, and that's about it as far as the indigenous population is concerned. So obviously the big question is, what, why did all these Tainos die? Was it Spanish cruelty, or was it something else? Las Casas, in his book, he had a clear answer. He described the conquistadors and psychopaths who were out to destroy the whole population of the Caribbean. His book was such a success in Europe that this became the prevailing view in the 16th century, what is called the Black Legend. The notion that the Spanish were barbaric people who purposely wiped out the entire Taino population. What today we would call a genocide, though the word had not been invented yet. A genocide is when you willfully destroy a, a people or its culture. There is no real debate on the destruction aspect. As I said earlier, the Tainos are no more. It's the willful part of the definition of genocide that has been de uh, debated by historians ever since. To me, it seems a bit strange that the Spanish, whose main goal was to exploit the Tainos under the repartimiento system, would want to kill them all. Surely they'd want to kill leaders like Anacoana and Atue, but not the whole laboring population, right? That doesn't make any kind of sense to me. And indeed, the account of Las Casas is a bit inaccurate or deceptive. Uh, which is why it's now referred to as a, the Black Legend. Uh, there were indeed a lot of atrocities. The conquest, the repartimiento, the death of Anacawana, all of that happened. Uh, but the vast bulk of the Tainos died not of Spanish steel, but of Spanish diseases, in a way that was not intentional. So now is the time to introduce the key term for today, the Colombian Exchange. It's a simple concept, but it has wide-ranging ramifications. In a nutshell, it simply refers to the exchange of diseases, crops, and animals during the age of Columbus. So a biological exchange from Europe and Africa to the Americas and back. You see, the epidemiological profile of Europe and the Caribbean were drastically different pre-1492. Uh, syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease, came from the Americas, and lo and behold, it showed up in Cadiz, Spain in 1492, right when Columbus and his crew came back from their fun Caribbean cruise. But Eurasia had far more contagious diseases like smallpox, measles, typhoid, the flu, and the plague. And then yellow fever and malaria, which came from Africa, uh, eventually made their way to the Americans as well. So diseases were a big part of the Colombian exchange. Why, you might ask, were there so many diseases in Eurasia than in the Americas in the first place? And for that, I recommend reading the book by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germ, and Steel. In this book, Diamond explains that America, because it is organized alongside a kind of a north-south axis, has a lot of ecosystems that are very distinct because it's difficult for animals and plants to migrate south or north through very different latitudes. Whereas the Eurasian continent, uh, being on an east-west axis, has vast areas along the same latitude, and so animals can spread easily among similar ecosystems, which leads to greater diversity. As a result, there were far fewer domestic animals in the Americas, llamas, guinea pigs, than there were in Europe, where there were cows and pigs and sheep and horses. Humans often contract epidemic diseases from animals that they're in close contact with. You've probably heard of the swine fever or the avian flu. So in Eurasia, where there were plenty of domestic animals, there were also plenty of viruses. Whereas in the Americas, uh, where there were few domestic animals, 
there were also a few contagious diseases. I mentioned syphilis before, there was also tuberculosis, which existed in Europe as well, and that's about it. As a result, many indigenous people, like the Taino, they had no built-up natural immunity against smallpox and other Eurasian diseases. And this, even more than Spanish exactions, is why within 50 years, the Taino population was nearly wiped out in the Caribbean. And why in the rest of the Americas, in places like Mexico or Peru, the indigenous population dropped by 90% within a century of the Spanish conquest. The wars of conquest surely played a role in it, as did forced labor under the Repartimiento, uh, but ultimately disease killed far more people than Columbus did. So consequence number one, the Colombian exchange ravaged the Amerindian population. Consequence number two, it facilitated the Spanish conquest because smallpox and horses gave the conquistadors an edge. Consequence number three, farming. When Columbus first came to the Caribbean and Central America, he encountered very different crops. Tobacco, rubber, cocoa, corn, tomatoes, yams, cassavas, pineapples, avocados. All of these were unknown in Europe. On the other hand, plenty of things that he was accustomed to in Europe did not exist in America. Staples like wheat, oranges, and grapes, or barnyard animals like pigs and sheep and cows. So in his second voyage, he tried to refashion the Caribbean environment in Europe's image, introducing the crops he knew from home in Italy. So many plants suited for a Mediterranean climate, like olive trees and grapes, were introduced but did not do well in the wet Caribbean though they later did quite well in similar climates like California or Chile. Europeans, they were also familiar with more tropical crops, in part because they had fought crusades in the Middle East in the previous centuries. So Europeans introduced uh, sugarcane as well to the Caribbean. It's a crop that likes plenty of heat and rain, uh, so it did great on the windward side of the Caribbean islands. So let's say you're drinking rum punch today, an iconic Caribbean cocktails. Well, it's made of rum, I eat sugarcane, and brown sugar, also from sugarcane, and lime juice, none of which existed among the Tainos. Uh, Colombian coffee, that would also be iconic. Well, coffee came from Ethiopia in Africa, also introduced by the Spanish during the Caribbean exchange. And if you like milk and sugar in your coffee, well, again, sugarcane isn't local, and neither are the cows that made the milk. If you like bananas from Guatemala, not local either. Originally, bananas came from Southeast Asia, and they were introduced to the Caribbean as a kind of a cheap foodstuff for the slaves. Same thing with the breadfruit tree of Polynesia. And on topic, you might want to watch the movie Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando. So pretty much all the basic crops that we associate with the Caribbean today are not native to the region, which had profound economic consequences, and that would be number four, I think. Initially, the Spaniards were mostly interested in mining, uh, and this worked well in Mexico and Peru because there there were extensive gold and silver mines. That was not the case in the Caribbean, so European colonizers for Spain and later the Dutch, the French, the English, they had to make money in a different way. And that different way was farming. Growing sugarcane and coffee for export to Europe, that became the big moneymaker in the Caribbean. So the very basis of the economy of the Caribbean for the next few hundred years, that was a direct consequence of the Colombian exchange exporting crops that were not native to the Caribbean. One problem, we already saw how the introduction of smallpox and other diseases wiped out the Taino population, the very people who could have worked on those plantations. So you had a disconnect that became central uh, to the history of the Caribbean. On one side, a profitable sector, the production of new crops like sugarcane and coffee, and on the other hand, a lack of manpower, also caused by the Colombian exchange, the Tainos. So who are you going to exploit if all the Taino laborers are gone? Well, in the next lecture, we'll see that in the 17th century, planters tried to bring in European laborers, often as indentured servants. But as it happened, also as part of the Colombian exchange, new diseases were introduced from Africa, specifically yellow fever and malaria, both of which are spread by mosquitoes, and so did very well in the moist region of the Caribbean, where sugarcane also grew well. So for the next 300 years or so, the Caribbean became very unhealthy for Europeans as well, not just Amerindians. So generations of Irish and other indentured servants came to Barbados and other places in the Caribbean and then died. And that would be consequence number five. So what kind of worker could you employ in your plantations then? Native Americans, gone. European workers, dying of yellow fever. 
Well, what about people who had been exposed to both African diseases and European diseases and had some degree of immunity to both? And that would be African slave labor. So ultimately, what brought about the Middle Passage and the horrors of the Atlantic slave trade was the Colombian exchange, consequence number six. African slaves were brought in to cultivate those new crops, sugarcane and coffee most prominently, and also because imported diseases had wiped out the other forms of labor, uh, namely Amerindians and Europeans. So a big consequence of the Colombian exchange was a demographic, you might say. It led to the large-scale migration of people from Europe and Africa, the ancestors of the majority of the Caribbean population today. The Colombian exchange helped create the Atlantic slave trade, but it also helped destroy it. In the next section, we'll study the Haitian Revolution, the one and only successful slave revolt in world history. The rebel slaves in Haiti, they won in part because the armies sent from Spain, Britain, and France to crush the slave revolt were ravaged by yellow fever, one after the other. So Haiti's independence that was consequence number seven, I think, of the Colombian exchange. So let's now move on to Europe and Asia and see how they were impacted by the Colombian exchange. As I said earlier, the only major disease introduced from the Americans was syphilis, an STD that was not a major killer in Europe, though it did second a number of popes, somehow. On the plus side of the balance sheet, however, was the introduction of a whole bunch of new crops from the Americans. Things like tomatoes, corn, potatoes, many of which did very well in the Eurasian climate. Imagine what Italian cuisine would be like nowadays without the tomato, or Irish cuisine without the potato. As a result, the population of Europe just boomed in the 15, 16, 1700s, uh, which was a big part of the rise of the West, the process whereby Europe came to dominate the rest of the world. We'll get back to it. So consequence number eight of the Colombian exchange, Europe's rise demographically at least. By now you might ask yourself, well, if the Caribbean was so unhealthy to Europeans, how come tourists go there all the time today? Well, that all goes back to the Spanish-American War of 1898, which we'll study much later in the course. Long story short, in 1898, the US defeated Spain and conquered Cuba. And as usual, the US and Spain lost way more soldiers to disease than to actual combat in the Caribbean. By that point, though, the medical profession was becoming more advanced, so one doctor made a suggestion. What if mosquitoes carried yellow fever? People didn't know that before. So the U.S. Army worked hard to rid Havana of mosquitoes after the Spanish-American War, and as it turned out, yellow fever disappeared, as did malaria, uh, which is spread by a different species of mosquitoes. So after that, there was a big anti-mosquito campaign around the region, and eventually a, a vaccine against yellow fever as well. Uh, so area of the Caribbean that used to be very unhealthy for Europeans now became very pleasant to live in, which led to the explosion of the tourism industry in the 20th century because people could now spend a few pleasant weeks in the Caribbean drinking coffee and rum punch without, you know, dying. Well, not when I'm taping this, which is early 2021, because yet another imported disease, COVID-19, has ravaged the cruise ship industry in the Caribbean. Well, another major development around the time of the Spanish-American War, that was the introduction of refrigerated steamships. So bananas, an imported crop, now became a major export as well. Yet another consequence of the Colombian exchange. So you could say that imported crops and imported diseases shaped the whole history of the Caribbean. Up until the 1800s, the norm was sugarcane and coffee grown by enslaved Africans. And then after 1900, when yellow fever was finally vanquished, the new economy was based on tourism and bananas. You could write a whole history of the Caribbean without ever mentioning Fidel Castro or Columbus and Anacahuana and Las Casas, looking instead at the interplay with the environment. In many ways, the racial makeup of the Caribbean today is also a legacy of the colonial exchange. In islands like the Bahamas or Curaçao, that had little water, no sugarcane was grown, few African slaves were imported, and the population is very ethnically European today. But in islands with abundant water, like Jamaica, Haiti, or Cuba, sugarcane could be grown, millions of African slaves were imported as a result, and their descendants represent the bulk of the present-day population, especially in Haiti, where yellow fever helped the slaves liberate themselves, and most white planters were killed or sent into exile. So in conclusion, what have we learned about that cup of coffee today? Well, it's a product of the Colombian exchange. The coffee was originally from Ethiopia. Sugarcane 
came through the Middle East, the dairy cow that came from Europe, and if you really want to put some rum in there, well, again, sugarcane was not native to the Caribbean. We also learn a couple of valuable things about the discipline of history. Uh, the first is that great white men aren't always the main drivers of history. Sure, people like Columbus and Las Casas, they're worth mentioning, uh, but many historical developments were caused by environmental factors, not people. So whether disease or human agency shapes the course of history, that's an ongoing debate among historians to this day. We also learn that history is a contested field. It's not black and white. This happened and that happened with 100% certainty. Instead, the sources are imperfect, and people who might be admired at some point in history, like Columbus or Las Casas, they might be reviled at a different time. And that's called historiography, how our understanding of history changes over time. And that process is still ongoing. A key issue for today was how many Tainos died as a result of the conquest, right? Well, how many then? What's the number? According to the book by Las Casas, there were millions of Tainos in Hispaniola before the conquest. But then modern scholars thought that he was exaggerating and that there were only a few hundred thousand people. Until last month, when a new genetic study came in late 2020, uh, showing that there may have been just 10,000 or 20,000 Tainos in Hispaniola as of 1492. So we're not done yet examining the complicated legacy of the Spanish conquest and the Colombian exchange. Caribbean historians like myself still have a lot of work to do. That's good news. Anyway, that was a whole history lesson in a cup of coffee. Goodbye and au revoir.